Thank you very much indeed. Um, I feel a little bit like Ayaz in this exalted company, if I may say, but uh, I would like to start by thanking Professor Shahabi for his kind invitation to present this small piece of research and for uh, Oliver for encouraging me to do it. I always find it's important to establish who to blame at the outset in case things do not go well. So, <laughs> um, it's, it's a long enough paper, I'll read some of it and, and, and skip over some of it, but my objective in the paper was to explore an episode of Iranian-Irish uh, sociocultural interaction uh, that has not been previously investigated from an Irish perspective. Um, I know Mansour was going to talk about Lady Wilde, and my story also concerns a, a lady who, along with her husband, who was the British minister to the court of the Shah, uh, was domiciled in Tehran from 1849 to 1853. She's not generally known as being Irish, but she certainly was, as indeed was her husband. So my uh, paper, I think I have some slides actually, I don't know how to get them going. Escape. Uh, I'm down here somewhere, okay. Sorry about this, I'd forgotten to, uh, yeah. And slideshow from the beginning, okay. Sorry about that. So my paper will focus on the story of Mary Wolf Scheel, to a lesser extent her husband Justin, uh, and explore issues of identity and religion uh, and how they influenced the approach she took uh, when she penned her well-known travelogue, Glimpses of Life and Manners in Persia, published in 1856 in London and regarded as the first travelogue written by a woman about Persia. Uh, my initial objective was to look at the text for what it tells us about the Shields, but also for what it might tell us about Persia during a most fascinating period in its history. And if you don't mind, I will use the word Persia throughout. I was interested in investigating to what extent the text embodies a typical example of cultural othering in colonialist travel writing. Uh, it has been uh, described as an exoticizing narrative less concerned with 19th century Persia but more with the discourse current at the time at the heart of the empire. Well, what soon becomes clear is that they have, um, for if I may express it like this, they have a paint here that they advertise. They say it does exactly what it says on the tin. So glimpses is what you get in terms of cultural literacy with Mary Shields' text. Yet, a more careful reading might suggest that their text is imbued with a subtlety and complexity manifesting as an underlying criticism of empire and the religion of empire hitherto unscrutinized. Before we look at those possibilities, perhaps I should establish the Shields' credentials and, uh, as being Irish. Um, <coughs> this is the Wolf household. Mary Shield was uh, born Mary Leonora Wolf in 1825. She was the only daughter of Stephen Wolf of Tyr MacLean in County Clare, near Ennis in fact. The family was of Norman origin, <clears throat> and indeed, if I may say, her grandmother was a McNamara, so very common, <laughs> very common in that area. Um, they held extensive lands in the Corbley area of Limerick, which is now a suburb of the city, and the branch of the family settled in County Clare. Mary's father is very interesting, Stephen. He was a very a leading figure in law in Ireland. He heard, held some of the most senior positions that any Catholic held in governance in Ireland. He was the Attorney General, the Chief Baron of the Exchequer, and he was involved with O'Connell uh, in the quest for Catholic emancipation. At least early on, they had a bit of a falling out and became estranged. The Shields were another leading uh, Catholic family of that time. Justin Shields' father had made, his, uh, had made a, uh, a fortune in Spain, and when it was possible for a Catholic to hold a long lease in Ireland, he came back and built a magnificent house on the banks of the River Shore in County Kilkenny, just outside Waterford City, on a beautiful piece of land that was actually eulogised in Spencer's epic poem, The Fairy Queen. And the family there lived a life of privilege, although the children had an in-house French émigré priest or refugee priest as a tutor, and it does seem like that the education was uh, staunchly Catholic and rigorously so. 
Um, Justin's elder brother, just as a side note, is probably well, more well known in Irish history. That was Richard Lawler Shield, and he was a prominent playwright. He was also very involved with O'Connell in the quest for Catholic emancipation in Ireland. And uh, when that was achieved in 1829, he did not wish to go much further, though O'Connell did, uh, in terms of breaking with the, the union with, with, uh, with Great Britain. And uh, in fact, he became a member of parliament and a government minister in a Whig government in, the, uh, uh, in London. Let's go through this very quickly. So um, these families were linked by educational background, professionally, and as prominent Irish Catholic families of their era involved in the quest for Catholic emancipation. A modern reading would probably see them characterised as West Britons, a term which has become popular again in uh, media circles over the last little while in our presidential election. But given the anatomy of Irish identity constructed after the struggle for independence at the beginning of the 20th century, they would probably be seen as that. The archetypal qualifications for being Irish in the New Ireland uh, included that one should be typically Gaelic speaking, a peasant, living in the west of Ireland and Catholic. Some leading figures in the Irish Revolution in carving out this particular conception of Irish identity went so far as to denounce Jews and Freemasons and others whose cultures did not correspond to their ideal implicitly Catholic notion of society, holding views which resonated with those being expressed at that time in right-wing circles in France and other European countries. But the Shields would probably not recognise themselves in the mirror of this retrospective othering uh, in the construction of the New Ireland. But they were sufficiently attuned to issues of identity and religion in their service to government and with respect to their place in society uh, to position themselves for the best possible beneficial outcome in their liaison with Persia and to engage in a discourse that involved, ironically, othering of the Persian milieu that they encountered. So let's try and move the shields to Persia. Um, in 1847, Justin Scheel, who was then 44, and Mary Scheel, who was uh, just 22, were married while Justin was home on leave from his assignment uh, in Persia, and the couple set out together uh, for Tehran in 1849. So Lady Scheel's published record of their sojourn at the court of the Shah is presented as a diary account of the family's travels, first as husband and wife and entourage, and returning with the addition of three young children, born to Lady Sheil while there. Additional notes on, as you can see, this is the title page of the original book, I think, uh, Russians, Turks and Kurds and so on. These are appended from the pen of Justin Sheil, probably to lend gravitas uh, and gain acceptance for the volume once published. Uh, won't go into a chapter by chapter analysis and I will leave out entirely the minister's appended notes, but there is a recurring theme discernible. Lady Shields' descriptions seem to represent classic expressions of cultural othering, stereotypical representation from a colonising location as it has been described. Persia is a decayed land requiring a civilising influence. The position of women is intolerable and no proper rule of law extends project protection or administers justice. Persians, she says, are a strange people. Lady Sheil uh, averse, and the morality, uh, mortality rather, the mortality amongst children is immense owing to neglect, ignorance and laziness. She finds the government despotic and the people a curious combination of bigotry and tolerance or perhaps indifference. Life is cruel and manners quite abhorrent and on taking her leave of the Orient she expresses full agreement with Murrier that the people are false, the soil is dreary and disease is in the climate. The inference is clear throughout Lady Shields' diary. The burden for improving matters rests squarely on the shoulders of the English and it is only in the extension of the benefits of the British Empire that, per that uh, Persia will prosper. In discussing the history of Islam in America, Ghanaia Basiri describes how in constructing an idea of what it meant to be American in the 19th century, a variety of responses conflated industrial progress commercial capitalism, egalitarian and enlightenment ideals, science, rationality, the white race and Protestant Christianity, to argue for the superiority of Anglo-American liberal Protestantism. 
He summarizes this as the conflation of race, religion and progress while allowing that these were not seen in the late 19th century as distinct analytical categories which could be examined together in defining a specific national identity. It is though a useful template, he argues, in viewing how others sought to position their own identity in attempting to belong and lay claim to a share of the unfolding American dream. A similar discourse, he contends, surrounded the attempts to justify European imperialism in Muslim countries and was used to legitimate the civilizing or modernizing project of colonization. Lady Shield's discourse and observations can therefore be located within the matrix of the conflation of race, religion and progress, the predominant discourse justifying colonization. In this reading, Persia, its people and religion is backward and European culture paramount. The account is intended to fix her reader's understanding of the Orient Occident, where Western identity is superior and civilizing missions justified. It paints a queer tableau of Persia and provides for her readers a biased ethnography, justifying the civilized civilizing goals of the coloner, colonizer. It has further been described as a typical gendered construction of the other Persian land, inviting colonial despoliation. There are anomalies, though, deserving of consideration in, in applying this categorization. One anomaly is that Lady Shield was, as highlighted at the outset, not English, but Irish, and very overtly Catholic. In her diary, Whilst not hiding her Catholicism, Lady Shield does abjure her Irishness and identifies herself very definitely as English. She has English ideas, lays claim to a reputation for English probity, and considers that she must be the first English woman who has been in Mazinderan. Her servants, though, are unmistakably Irish, and as she describes them, as ignorant. And there's one very funny episode where she is attending a Catholic mass that is being celebrated by a Catholic Armenian priest and her servants are absolutely horrified to find that the priest's wife and daughters are in attendance in the congregation. <laughs> Explain that to so. some. <laughs> Lady Shield's reasons for positioning herself in this manner may be a response to what she experienced and observed in Ireland and purposefully designed so that her diary might be well received once published at the heart of the empire. In other words, she sought to represent herself as outside her own colonized mil milieu, at least with respect to her nationality, if not her religion. Why she, would not why she would feel, rather, the need to abnegate her nationality, but feel secure in publicly asserting her Catholicism requires some explanation. Now, I'm not a historian, and I bow to the historians who are here, uh, but it is an interesting aspect of this, and I just offer this as a, as a thought on the subject. In his exposition of how Irish people were regarded in Victorian Britain, and in particular how that view was represented in Victorian caricature, Curtis contends that Irish people were explicitly discriminated against on the basis of race as well as religion. Highly contested, this was in the late 1980s, uh, by scholars amongst others were Sheridan Gilly in the UK, who felt that uh, the discrimination against Irish people was based on religion and could not possibly have been based on race. How could white people racially discriminate against other white people? But one could say that what Curtis had going for him to some extent was a lot of very compelling pictorial evidence taken from his collection of caricature. So in any event, this racism applied in his view to Irish Catholic immigrants to Britain and to Irish Catholics still domiciled in Ireland. But according to Curtis, the Victorian paddy construct took on more than one go guise and English caricaturists created a ver veritable topography of Irish facial features. I won't go into all this, I've covered it in the paper, but the idea was that there were a number of different possible Irish uh, characters uh, who had various different shapes of their head depending on how politicised they were <laughs> mainly, that uh, coming from orthognathos, prognathos, uh, becoming more animal-like until eventually you come to the worst, the Fenian, politicised Irish person who appears simian. It's a simian representation. Um, but this wasn't just the case in caricature. It also was the case uh, in, uh, in print. Uh, for example, this is from Bretherton, who's writing about Irish Catholics at the time and I hope you don't mind if I include it. The Irish as a race have no care for material possessions, he writes. They are inefficient and untrustworthy in business. They hate stable government and hate the law. 
Unfortunately, the man-eaters of Kerry and the troglodytes of Tipperary are inspired to an even greater degree, being more completely Hibernian, by the same superabounding national conceit which drives the natives to murder. If only to remember that the Hibernian proper has the slave mentality and will act accordingly. He is a mixture of childlessness and ferocity. He is basely superstitious, callous to suffering, credulous, excitable, thriftless, untruthful, dirty, pettily dishonest, destructive, cunning, imitative, tortuous, devoid of moral courage, and intensely vain. So you imagine what he had to be vain about. <laughs> what he had to be vain about. In short, the Irish are very much like Lady Shields Persians. See? But where Lady Shield would not have been necessarily located in any of Curtis's typologies, she certainly would have occupied a space where she would not have been exempt from the opprobrium uh, directed at Irish Catholics. And, and that is the point. And Curtis further makes the point that if that was the lens through which Irish Catholics were viewed, it was not the lens through which English Catholics were viewed. So English Catholics, though regarded as inferior, were not as corrupt, immoral, superstitious, and significantly politicised as were Irish Catholics, the presumption being that Catholicism itself had been corrupted by the ignoble paddy. Lady Shield makes no attempt to disguise her Catholicism and is careful to represent herself as English and Catholic within the pages and in the publication of her travelogue. Set against the conflation of race, religion and progress, Lady P Shield positions herself towards the outer edges of what might be accepted. Her relative youth was no bar to her adoption of a sophisticated, nuanced self-representation, but can easily be understood in the context of the political, religious tapestry of her background. It is clear that uh, religion played a central role in the life of the Shield family, not only in their family background, formation, and in the involvement of their families with the quest for Catholic emancipation. The family's religiosity is evidenced by the fact that in later times, two of the ten Shield children entered Catholic orders as nuns, another became a religious brother, and one a priest, quite a famous, uh, he was the last novitiate of Cardinal Newman and took over eventually his famous oratory in Birmingham, Florence Shield. While in Persia, Lady Shield was acutely aware of matters religious and was concerned constantly that the family could access Catholic rites. Her observations on religion in Persia, which are many in her narrative, are therefore of great importance, more so for, not for being more than a little contradictory. For all her othering of Persia and Persians, she makes some strident statements about religious freedom and practice among the Muslim populace. She finds freedom of speech on an equality with freedom of religion in Persia. When she attends a dramatic Ashura presentation depicting the martyrdom of the Imam Hussein, which she describes in great detail, Lady Shield finds herself impelled to join in the weeping of the other attendees. At another time, she allows that the Muslim's call to prayer excites a combination of feelings of dignity, solemnity and devotion compared with which the din of bells becomes insignificant. And she juxtaposes this against the solemn awe inspired by the keening as it sweep, sweeps afar over the dales and hills of monsters, monster even, announcing a gale has been gathered to his father. Even so, she concludes, the call to prayer is an imposing thing to hear. St. Peter's and St. Paul's together can produce nothing to equal it. She goes further with a comment on equality of opportunity, using for an example the then Prime Minister, the Amir Nizam Mirza Taki Khan. In Persia and other Mohammedan countries, there is a large fund of personal equality and obscurity of descent is not an obstacle to advancement. Set against her other scathing assessments, one is tempted to conclude that these comments are more an oblique criticism of the position of her own religious faith in the empire, perhaps even in her own homeland, and indeed a criticism of empire itself over and against the position she adopts within the paradigm of contemporary discourse, as suggested by Ghanaia's Basiri's Matrix of Conflation. Lady Shield's critique is not in the same vein as the type of counter-Orientalist or anti-imperialist discourse variously engaged in by Blunt and Brown. Her criticism are more subtle and insinuated from the cover of an established identification with one side of a binary Orientalist discourse and are proffered within the purlius of a commentary on religion and religious matters. Good. Uh, just a few more things to say. I hope everybody is still... <laughs> Three minutes. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. 
I'll cut it down. So another example of this underlying critique of empire, just to pursue that point for a little bit further, is found in Lady Shield's descriptions of the episode of the Bab and the Babi upheavals. Her recounting of the story is broadly sympathetic, if containing a number of factual inaccuracies, repeating some of the general misconceptions concerning the Bab and his followers current at the time. And she goes into quite a lot of detail about what happens and spends a lot of time describing the various different things uh, until eventually she, she comes to describe the faith of the celebrated Babi poetess Kuratalain, which she says was a cruel and useless deed. She also then, in her final summation, summation of that section of her, of her diary, she recounts that the Babis had garnered some popular sympathy for their fate, such that she says, uh, it thus appears that even in Persia, a vague, undefined feeling of liberality in religion is taking place, is taking root, excuse me. So this is a very overt critique, I would think, of the status quo in Britain. Now, just a few uh, notes about sources and gender. And again, I'll just cut it back uh, for the time that we have. Lady Shield was greatly circumscribed as a woman in making direct contact with Persian and her travel Persians, and her travelogue relies to a great extent on second-hand information through her husband, from the household staff at the ministry, from expatriate visitors to the mission. Uh, for example, for her information, oh God, I forgot all about the slides. Anyway, there's some more of those terrible cartoons. That one I absolutely love, because it's not just the Simeon representation of Ireland, but it's also a child getting a <laughs> trashing around the ears. This is from the book, uh, she has some drawings in the book, they're not attributed, and this is her uh, transliteration of Nazaruddin Shah, the Shah of Persia. And this love, I love this one, it's a Persian women seated on a carpet, <laughs> gossiping outside the doctor's door. <sighs> but this is an interesting character, if I just may do a sidebar here, because some of the information that Lady Shield includes about the Bab, and particularly this pen portrait that she has of the Bab, did not come from any of the sources that I mentioned. For example, it did not come from the minister's uh, reports back to the Foreign Office in London. But it, was, it's, it has been speculated that they came from this character, whose name was Dr. William Cormick, who was domiciled in Tabriz, and who attended the Bab in his capacity as a physician on a num number of occasions following the Bab's interrogation and bastinadoing in 1848 in Tabriz, and who left in a letter to a friend a very similar uh, description as Lady Shield has in her book. Now, Dr. Cormick, in, in terms of Ireland and Iran. Dr. Cormac was from son of a Kilkenny man who uh, went and lived in, in, in Tabriz, who was also a doctor. And Dr. Cormac was his son, came back to the UK, studied as a doctor, and followed in his father's footsteps, and was actually attached to the uh, court of the Crown Prince when he was the governor of, uh, of that area until such time as he ascended the throne as Nazaruddin Shah. So it's just another interesting connection between Ireland and Iran, that we have these two people of Irish background probably in communication with each other and also caught up in the maelstrom of fairly extraordinary events. So finally then, um, just a couple of things if I may. Yeah, Lady Shield did make efforts to learn Persian and by her own account acquired sufficient proficiency to allow her to have direct communication with a few, let me get back to this one for this, <laughs> direct communication with a few Persian ladies whom she would occasionally visit. On two occasions she had tea with the Queen Mother, visited various female relatives of the Shah and was invited to call on the wife of the Prime Minister. There's a lovely story of her visiting the, the Queen Mother and the palace and how the Queen Mother is, is taking her on a tour of the inner palace apartments. They come upon the Shah seated in an inner garden on his own and engage in this converse, convivial conversation with him. And then he takes over the tour and guides them through the rest of the palace, particularly the newer parts, which she says he was immensely proud of. So Lady Shield's interviews, uh, with the, particularly with the women, uh, do open an insight into the position or role of women close to the government at that time. To some extent, the, woman, the women rather, she met are represented in terms of the colonizing stereotype. They appear as frivolous and eroticized 
in assessing areas no male travel writer of her time could hope to enter, Lady Shield does adopt what can be described as a masculine stance and observes with an imperial gaze, but not entirely. The Queen Mother is recognised as being very clever and is supposed to take a large share in the affairs of government. The Grand Vizier's wife, with whom Lady Shield met meets prior to her departure from Persia, is not only remarkably intelligent, but also highly uh, esteemed and respected. Lady Shield finds the few Persian women she became acquainted with generally lively and clever, restless and intriguing, able managers of their husbands' and sons' affairs, though the instrument of the influence, their influence rather, she reveals as incessant talking and teasing. There is a hint, though, in this of an alternative paradigm for the position of women, at least in the upper echelons of Persian society. Can I just finish with a short uh, reference to a review that appeared uh, in 1856 of Lady Shields' travelogue once it was published by John Murray in London. It's a fairly flattering, at the beginning, uh, review. Then it starts to take her to task for various different points that she has made until eventually it gets to a stage where, it, when she has mentioned Aga Muhammad Khan and he's, he's uh, pensioned for collecting the eyes of his enemies and at the same time she says he was tremendously benign and beneficent as a ruler to his people, the uh, reviewer can't contain himself and he says this must have been penned by someone on Dr Connolly's care at Hanwell and Connolly was a well-known Victorian psychiatrist and Hanwell his asylum near London. But interestingly, nowhere in the review is she described as Irish, though her husband, the minister, is when a paragraph contained in his notes that was appended to the travelogue is cited and derided as having only possibly been penned by someone suckled on the Emerald Isle. Uh, she is, though, chided for her Romanistic zeal in comparing Catholic Lent to Muslim Ramadan. Having succeeded in avoiding any anti Irish backlash, and experiencing only a relatively mild rebuke for her Catholicism, Lady Shield is excoriated for something she might have foreseen would stand against her in her newfound role as a published commentator on the Orient. She is put down because she is a woman. The reviewer continues, Lady Shield will forgive us like a good wife when we say that the most valuable portion of her book is the additional notes by her husband. <laughs> Ooh. Um, just to conclude then, Lady Shields' travelogue can be seen as a typical example of Orientalist Victorian travel writing, travel writing <laughs> culturally and racially othering her adopted milieu. Her position as the wife of the British minister to Tehran, to Tehran at a time when Britain was manoeuvring for increased influence in Persia renders her position far from neutral and her glimpses of life and manners can be understood as an attempt to fix her reader's acceptance for the need of a civilising intervention in that country. Factors that have not been considered previously do bear on her narrative and a nuanced criticism of empire can be discerned as an outcome of a combination of influences relating to her own national and religious identity. Her Irishness and Catholic faith in particular need to be considered when assessing her contribution to the discourse of the time, which can be described in terms of Ghanaia Basiri's matrix of the conflation of race, religion and progress. In the end, she provides us with a fascinating occasion of socio-cultural interaction between Persia and Ireland in the mid-19th century. She died actually quite young at the age of 44, having given birth to 10 children. And uh, she's buried on her own, uh, quite strangely, in Glasnevin in this plot. And uh, somebody thought that she deserved a rose. So thank you very much. Thank you.